you're at. But we're going to be in Ruth 2, and I'm going to work my way through the b- b- Ruth 2 today. For those of you who weren't here for a sermon last week, or maybe you slept through it, that's always, I guess, a, a possibility. Um, let me review for you what we talked about last week. Now, the book of Ruth takes place in the time of Judges, and if you don't know how to find Ruth, um, you've, you've got the early Bible, then you get the Judges, right? And then you have Ruth. And Ruth is a short little book. In my Bible, it's four pages. Um, Some Bibles, it's as little as two or three pages. And it's sandwiched between Judges and the Kings, right? So if if you're looking for where to find it, uh, I jokingly said last week it's 475. That's the page number in my Bible anyhow. But uh, it's not too far into your Bible if you'd like to find Ruth. But grab that open and, and we'll... Keep your thumb in there because we're going to be exclusively in the book of Ruth today. And the book of Ruth, as I said, takes place in this time of Judges. And if you want to know more about that period, I recommend you actually read the book of Judges to get a little bit of the context, a little bit of the background of what the world was like and particularly what uh, the Jewish world was like at the time uh, of Ruth. But in, in summary, the time of Ruth, the time of Judges, was perhaps one of the most, if not the most, dark seasons in the history of Israel. We're told again and again and again throughout the book of Judges, as you read about the leaders and the people in the time of Judges, it says these words, and you don't want these words said about you anywhere, but it says these words in the Bible about these folks, and it says, and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And it says that again and again. And again, only a couple of examples throughout that entire book does it say anything other than, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And and what it does is we're told this over and over and over. So we see that the the people of God were doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, but they, they were frequently turning their backs on God and they were living sinful, immoral lives. And then in contrast to that, we see the book of Ruth. And, and Ruth comes through after just this dark, depressing story in Judges. Ruth comes through as kind of this lone little bright spot, right? A light in the darkness, shining in the wilderness. And, 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 and Ruth just kind of on the heels of Judges is, is glowing and beautiful and wonderful. And as I mentioned last week, it's tremendous in its literature. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. You read the book of Ruth and it's kind of like an onion because you just you can keep peeling back layer after layer after layer of it. And, and it's beautiful. And, and one of the overarching themes throughout the book of Ruth, uh, one of those big layers of it, if you want to call it that, is this theme, is this idea of the sovereignty of God. You see this woven throughout the book of Ruth. Now, the story starts off with a man by the name of Elimelech who decides to move himself, his wife, and his two sons. His wife's name is Naomi. And they decide, he decides he's going to move his family to Moab. Not Moab in Utah, but Moab in the Middle East. And uh, because there was a famine that had come upon the land in Bethlehem where they were living. And as I said, it's great literature. And at this point, the Bible uses irony because... The town of Bethlehem literally means the house of bread, particularly in the Old Testament. The Hebrew words have meaning. And so the, the word Bethlehem itself means house of bread. And so this point of irony comes up because the house of bread has no food, right? And so he moves his family to another region, a region where the people are worshipers of another god, a false god, a, a fertility god by the name of Chemosh. And, and once there... Um, His two sons take on Moabite wives, something they weren't supposed to do as Jews. They weren't supposed to mix with this other tribe, but they did. They take on these two Moabite women as daughter-in-laws. Their names are Ruth and Orpah. And, And then the story has another point of irony at this point in the story, because at that point in Ruth 1, after having moved to save his family, after having moved to avoid famine, having moved to avoid death... What happens? Well, Elimelech dies and the two sons die, right? So the the Bible is this beautiful, beautiful literature and and it has this great irony in it. And what this does then is it strands Naomi in a land with none of her family because they've moved away. It doesn't have any of her, so to speak, church or temple support. There's no other worshipers there of the one true God. They're living in a land that they're not supposed to live in with a people they're not supposed to be with. And it's at this point in the story, Naomi hears, things are starting to pick back up back in Bethlehem. There's food there again. 
So she assesses her situation, and it's bleak. She says, well, I'm going to pack up my bags, and I'm heading back home. It's kind of like the reverse Beverly Hillbillies, right? So she's going back. Well, as she's going back, her two daughter-in-laws start on this trek with her, but she tries to convince them gently, you probably don't want to go back with me. And so after a very short period, her one daughter-in-law, Orpah, says, yeah, you know what, you're right. I'm going back home. Goes back and, and stays with the Moabites where she grew up with her friends, with her family, with her culture. Ruth, however, Ruth says, no. I'm not going to be shook off that easy. And she says, she says some wonderful words, and I think it speaks deeply to the relationship and the trust and specifically to the character that Naomi was, the the character that she had. And Ruth says these words to her mother-in-law, and she says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you stay, I'm going to stay. Wherever you live, I'm going to live. Whoever your people are, they're going to be my people. Whoever your God is, that will be my God. And then she takes it even a step further. I mean, it's, it's enough to pledge yourself in that way. But then she goes, and if I go back against this, if I break this vow, may your God strike me dead. Right? So she's pretty serious in saying, I'm, I'm with you thick or thin. I'm with you, Naomi. Wherever you go, I'm going to go with you. So they get back to Bethlehem. Naomi and Ruth arrive. And uh, they make it there safely. And all the ladies in town... They, they see her. They're like, oh, yeah, I remember you. You know, they, they kind of recognize her, but they're like, you look different. You know, the, the years away have really taken their toll on her. She, she looks different. Now, they know her name is Naomi, and as we talked about last week, Naomi means sweetheart. She was a sweetie of a woman. And so they're like, Naomi, Naomi, you look different. I mean, welcome back, but you look different and probably not in a good way, right? And she says, you know what? Quit calling me Naomi. Start calling me Mara. Well, what does Mara mean? The name Mara means that I'm bitter and I'm angry, right? She says, don't call me sweetie anymore. That those days have passed and now I'm angry and bitter. And that brings us to Ruth chapter 2. Well, I'll remind you just briefly that this series of sermons is a great entry point into the Easter season. The story of redemption is woven throughout the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation. But there's places where you can really see the beauty of God working. And the book of Ruth is one of those. It lends itself very well, setting us up as we head towards Easter. And, and my idea behind this series of sermons is that we would walk through some extended sections of Scripture, um, I'll read to you some some portions of scripture, most of the book of Ruth, through the next few weeks. Uh, that way, at the very least, I know you have heard scripture a little bit uh, here at church and, and set you up for the week. My hope is, of course, that you read the Bible at home every week and you're in the Word every day. But I know better than that as a pastor that not all of us are in the Word every day. So at the very least, I can be assured you're getting some feeding here from this. So with that, we'll jump off here into uh, Ruth chapter 2, if you're following along. And it says there, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, from the clan of Elimelech, which was her husband, a man of standing, whose name was Boaz. So we have a new character being introduced into the story, a man by the name of Boaz. He's a, a relative of Naomi's husband. And we see here that he's a man of standing, right? Which means he's a man of position in the society. He's a man of wealth, a a man who would have owned land, which means he's pretty well off and he has some security. And then Ruth, the Moabitess, says to Naomi, let me go out into the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes that I find favor. So Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Let me explain the process of gleaning to you if you haven't heard about this before. Gleaning was the Old Testament version of kind of the food shelf or the food bank, right? It was, it was the place where those who had nothing could go and get themselves some food so they wouldn't starve. The idea, at least, was that the landowners were supposed to leave specific segments of their property, 
uh, of their fields unpicked. So if you were growing wheat, you'd leave some wheat there, or barley or corn or whatever it was that you were growing. There were some assigned segments and portions and areas that you weren't supposed to harvest. Places like the very edges of the field and the corners of the field, where the poor, where the, the orphans, where the widowed could go and, and collect some food and, and keep going. So it wasn't a hand out, but it was a a hand up, so to speak. You had to go do the work. You had to go collect it. Nobody was going to give it to you, but at least you had the opportunity to go and get it. But unfortunately, the problem was that landowners were often not of the generous sort. So they would regularly leave very little behind. In fact, they kind of lived with the idea that I think we sometimes still see in the world today of what is the minimum I can do and still be a follower of Yahweh. You know, I'll follow the rules. I'll follow the law because they were supposed to do this by law. So I'll follow the rules, but I'm not going past what I absolutely have to do as a bare minimum, right? Even 3,000 years later, we struggle with that same kind of attitude sometimes, don't we? Anyhow, as it turns out, Ruth finds herself in a field of Boaz, a man she's never met before, a man she doesn't know is among Naomi's relatives. And note how here it mentions in Scripture that she happens to find herself working in the field, right? This is a literary technique where uh, we see this employed throughout this book. And, And what it is is it's to focus us on the sovereignty of God. If you don't know what sovereignty means, that's just a fancy $2 seminary word that simply means that God is in control and that he is looking out for us. Continuing on here then in verse 4. And it says that Ruth is now in the field gleaning and just then Boaz arrives out to the fields from Bethlehem and he greets his harvesters. Hear this. He says, the Lord be with you, right? What do the people that are working in his field say? The Lord bless you they called back to him. I mean, how many of you have ever worked at a place like that, right? The boss rolls in and shouts to everybody, the Lord be with you. I mean, I work in a church and that's never happened. (laughs) Right? But it sounds like a great place to work. I mean, you got a Christian boss and better yet, all the blue collar folk, they all holler back, you know, the Lord bless you too. And it's a good work environment. Sounds like a place to be. So anyhow, Boaz, he shows up on the scene and he surveys his work site. He checks out his field and he sees something's a a little bit out of place, right? Boaz says to his foreman of harvesters, he says, whose young woman is that over there, right? And the foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. And she said, Please, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. And then hear this, Boaz. Then she went out in the field, right? And she has worked steadily from morning until now, except for a very brief, short little rest in a shelter. So now Boaz is aware of who she is. I mean, it's a small town. He's probably already heard about this young lady coming back with Naomi to town, probably had already heard their stories about how Elimelech had died and how the sons had died and how they had come back to town with with not a penny to them. And now he hears, oh yeah, she's out in the fields working her tail off. This is a hard-working gal. She's been working all day with just a short little break. So he knows a little something here about Ruth's character. 2.8 2.8 there. It says, So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't, don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and then follow along after the girls. And I've told the men, Do not touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water, the jars that the men have filled. Now, this comes on the heels of the report from his foreman. Anyone else think uh, at this point Boaz is showing a little bit of an interest in Ruth, right? Ruth gets some sweet treatment from Boaz. He says, he says, Ruth, here's some ladies for you to hang out with. 
for you to do your work with so you don't have to work by yourself. And that's a big deal because she would have been working by herself behind the ladies, which is a little bit shaming. Everybody who'd walk by that field would go, oh yeah, there's that poor person, right? There's that down and out young lady. But now she's in with all the other ladies, just like anybody else, right? Looks just like one of his employees. So he says, he gives her some status and, and, and gives her a place and, and some comfort. Very nice, nice thing for him to do. But then beyond that, in this culture, the woman with the, the lowest social rank, she would have been the one who would have drawn the unsavory assignment of having to fill these water jugs regularly from the well. And if you're not familiar with the region, this could mean an awful lot of work because many of these wells are very, very deep. Some of them are hundreds of feet deep. And what you've got to do is you've got a rope and you've got to lower uh, a bucket, a pail, or a jar down, which is not so tough, but a little hard on the hands, right? I mean, ropes of those times weren't probably smooth and nice and comfortable in your hands. But then you yeah, get that bucket all full of water at the bottom. Now you've got to start lifting it up, right? Now maybe that first jar that you bring up, maybe not so much, but we're talking they have to have enough water to keep the men of the field hydrated, right? And all these ladies who are working. That's quite a bit of water that people could drink throughout the day in a, in a very arid region. And so this is a lot of work that, that normally would have been her assignment. But Boaz takes it from her. Boaz says, no, you don't have to do that either. Just go ahead and drink out of the jars. The guys are going to be getting the water basically, right? So, so again, he offers a, a beautiful, wonderful blessing to her. And then in 2.10 it says that this, she bowed down with her face to the ground and she exclaimed, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, me, a foreigner? 11, Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So Ruth shows honor and respect to Boaz for his kindness. And then he, in return, pays her a compliment for her loyalty and for her character. And then not only that, he offers up a blessing for her. I mean, we talked about this a little bit last week about sovereignty, but it is abundantly clear here that God is looking out for her and Naomi as well, but specifically for her. And not only that, I, I, do, think, I do think Boaz is he's flirting with her, right? How many thought you were coming to a love story today? Eh, we're getting it. 13. It says, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she says. You have given me comfort, and you have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing to even be one of your servant girls. It seems like here Ruth is a bit shocked. She's taken aback a little bit. She's, she didn't expect this sort of treatment, but she is grateful for Boaz's generosity. So she humbly responds to him, even though she doesn't feel like she's worthy of this level of treatment from him. And the story continues on in 14, and it says, At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Hey, Ruth, come over here. Come over here, Ruth. Have some bread. Here, dip it. Dip it in this wine vinegar. You ever been to Olive Garden where they pour the olive oil and the vinegar on the plate? And, right? It's kind of like that. I mean, there wasn't like candlelight going on here and <laughs> violin or anything, but... Yeah, something's going down. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. Nice. She ate all that she wanted, and she had some leftovers, it says. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, even if she gathers among the sheaves, which is the prime real estate, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stocks for her, from your bundles, the stuff that you've already gathered, and then leave them for her to come behind you and pick them up. 
right? And don't rebuke her for it. Because normally, you weren't supposed to be doing this. So now, not only is Boaz, he's given her food to take home, he's feeding her at work, and he's given her a to-go box to take home with her that evening, right? And it's, it is like Olive Garden, it kind of. And, and it's not only just any old food, but it's the good stuff. This is the food off the Lord, off the master's table, right? This is good stuff. He's giving her the good stuff. He gives her the doggy bags, the leftover, and when she goes back to work, Boaz tells his crew, not only is she able to pick up the bits and pieces that people are normally, you know, the, the poor people, the widows, the orphans, they're normally able to pick up kind of the scraps, but more so than just this little bit that's been falling to the ground, what I want you to do is give her the good stuff. Give her some full stocks. Give her the stuff that you've already put the labor in to, to gather. Before she was picking up scraps, and now she's getting the good stuff, right? Verse 17. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley that she had gathered, and it amounted to about an epath, which is like 30 to 50 pounds of barley. That's a lot of barley. And she carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much that she had gathered. And Ruth had also brought out and gave to Naomi what she had left over from lunch, right? The good stuff. She gives her mother-in-law the good stuff. She could have like kept that to herself, but no. She shares that with Naomi. And her mother-in-law says, Ruth, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about whose place she had been at, where she'd been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. I can imagine in that moment, I mean, just Naomi's jaw almost hitting the floor, right? In walks Ruth with like a week, maybe two weeks worth of barley. Like, it takes a long time to, eh, you ever seen barley? You know how long it takes to gather 30 to 50 pounds of barley by hand? A while, right? Not a simple task. She comes rolling in with like 30, 40, 50 pounds with takeout box, right? Big smile on her face. I've been working at Boaz's place today, right? Ruth hit the jackpot. So Naomi asks the obvious question, where in the world did all of this come from? To which Ruth says, from Boaz. Boaz! Right? Verse 20. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative and he is one of our kinsmen redeemers. He's a relative of ours. Well, he's my husband's relative, but it still counts. He's our relative, right? He's somebody who might be willing to take care of us, Ruth, for the long term. They were worried about their long-term security. I mean, yeah, they were getting by right now, but these ladies didn't have much. And here comes this guy, you know. They didn't wear armor and they didn't ride white horses, but kind of like that, riding in, right? We have nothing of our own. We have no husbands. We have no sons to take care of us. And you managed to, again, randomly, pick my generous, generous relative's field to go pick grain in, right? And 21. Then Ruth the Moabite has said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all the grain. What does that mean? That means not only did I end up in your rich, generous relative's field for today, but he asked me to come back tomorrow, and then the next day, and the next day, and the next day until the harvest is done. He said, I can come every day, right? We have some security now. We have some future now. God is really looking out for us. 22, Naomi said to, her, said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, and I can just see her at this point, you know, kind of the fingers kind of doing this. Hmm, she's thinking. 
hmm, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls. Because in somebody else's field, you might be harmed. And now she doesn't know he's already given her this promise. But he's, she's saying, yeah, I think you should go back there, right? That sounds like a pretty good deal. Because you see, I think Naomi knows that the game is on. She's, she's now seeing Boaz is looking out for my Ruthie. You know, it's that whole, love is in the air, everywhere I look around, right? Love is in the air, every sight and every sound. All right, whatever. Sorry about that. I got a little off. And so the story closes with these words in 23. And so Ruth, you see, Ruth, she stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvests were finished. And she continued on living with her mother-in-law. She didn't abandon Naomi. She stayed with her. Ruth keeps going back, and she's going to see Boaz every day, right? Now, this is my cliffhanger ending, and you're going to have to tune in next week to hear how the story goes. So if you're here this week, you better come back next week if you want to know what happens between Ruth and Boaz in the next portion. Of course, you could always just read your Bible, too. That's okay. You can spoil the ending, and I'm all right with it. But come back next week because we're going to continue on this story. We're going to continue seeing the sovereignty of God. We're going to continue seeing God's fingerprints in this beautiful story of redemption. And we're going to continue to see how, as God works in the background of the story, redeeming and working miraculously and beautifully, we are able to see within that a mirroring of how God works in our lives loving us, providing for us, sovereignly looking over us, redeeming us across time. So it's a beautiful story, very applicable, and I pray that it is a blessing for you. Let's pray.